So the, there's two ways to understand the, the tension between profitability and social impact for microfinance. One of them is structural. And the reason there is that microfinance, as the name says, is about providing very, very small loans to people, mostly destitute clients. So it's mostly pover impoverished or relatively destitute populations. And so what you have, and, and usually these populations are in rural or remote areas. And so what you have is a lot of people who are scattered around who are going to be receiving very, very small loans. Right? And so just by the nature of that, it means that you need agents who are going to go out and look for these clients right? and, and sell them the idea of taking on a loan and explaining to them what a loan means and then educating them in the process and then actually granting a loan and then supervising how the loan does. And again, because these people are in very remote areas, that means that you need people to go out and find them. And if you think about how finance works, um, you're doing all that work and you're only granting them very small loans, right? And so let the, the quote unquote bang for your buck that you get for providing the service is relatively small. So that means that it's an inherently expensive service to deliver. Um, and there's two ways in which microfinance organizations can kind of cover the costs of providing that. One is just by charging high interest rates. Um, and so if you look at the average interest rates that are normally charged by microfinance companies, when you look at them the first time you see them, they seem extremely high, right? And you, you, usually people that are not familiar with the industry, the first time they see the interest rates are like, wow, and this is the interest that you're charging to poor people? Like, how is that possible? Well, the reason is that it's an incredibly expensive service to provide. Now, the reason why it's okay to charge such high interest rates is number one is, you know, you have to recover your costs. But number two, usually people who receive microfinance loans can make very productive investments with them. And so it's, it's, a, it's unquestionably a good deal for the recipients of the loans, even if you're charging them a relatively high interest rate. Um, the second way in which microfinance organizations can absorb the cost of such an expensive service is to try to standardize it or automate it in any way possible, right? And so, you know, there, there's kind of, you, you try to find any kind of um, economy of scale that you possibly can. And so basically, if you have loan officers who are going out there, what you want is that each loan officer should have as many loans under management as possible so that you know the, the, the most expensive thing is the salary of that loan officer and so you basically want to get as much as possible from that same individual and the way to do that is to try and automate or standardize as many of your processes as possible and so right there you have the tension between you know the, the sort of the structure of the service that is very, very costly and all the needs of the organization to try and basically get as much as you possibly can from that expensive service or the expense of providing the service. Now, the second layer of tension comes from the fact that if one of the economic ways for you to solve how expensive it is to provide the service is to automate or standardize the decisions, the problem with that is that you have clients who are very poor, or at least relatively poor, and who basically have very specialized needs. And so because their needs are specialized, it's actually extremely difficult to standardize the service. They need a lot of customization, right? Um, it's very difficult to, for example, create an algorithm that automates whether you should grant a loan to these people or not, because they all look very different. Um, and they don't have a lot of, um, let's say, hard information or systematic information in a database out there somewhere that you can just log in and look at them and then decide like these people are good clients or not. You actually have to go in and analyze one by one. And if they get in trouble, for example, um, it's kind of very difficult to know um, what, like, as, a, as an automated response, what you should do with that because each client has very, very specialized needs. And that's where the tension between the need for sort of profitability or cost reduction and the need for customization arises, right? If you truly want to have a social impact, 
That means you need to provide very customized services for these clients because that's what they require. They require a lot of education. They require um, help on their specific business ideas. They require help on their specific problems or needs that arose that maybe led them to not be able to repay a loan on time, for example. So, so they have very specialized needs, yet the organization has all this pressure to standardize and automate as many of the things as they possibly can just because of the nature of the service that they provide. And so that's kind of a summary of the structural reason for these tensions between standardization and um, sort of social impact. Now there's a second layer to this, which is that one of the reasons why microfinance became so popular as a tool to alleviate uh, poverty in the 70s and 80s is because as people started providing microfinance services in Bangladesh and, and in other Asian countries, um, it kind of became clear that poor people could pay a high interest rate. Like they could make really productive investments and say so they could actually pay a high interest rate. And that made it seem like there was kind of no tension there, meaning you can go out, give them a loan that is going to help them work themselves out of poverty because they can make investments that are very productive for them and they can pay the cost of it. So you don't need donor money. The, the, the promise was that you could have this self-sustaining machine that could help poor people work themselves out of poverty. When that sort of came out and, and evidence started coming out that these loans that had no collateral, that were very small, that were very productive for, for destitute people, that allowed them to improve their economic lives, could um, become sustainable for an organization or could be delivered without um, the need for uh, donor funding necessarily, it started drawing a lot of attention from external donors and, and, and people who were interested in the industry or who were interested in poverty alleviation in general. And so a lot of donor money started coming into microfinance and that started growing the industry. And as the industry grew, sort of the first layer, let's say the first wave of money was probably donor money who thought this was a good way to get additional impact for their money. But then when other people started realizing that there was a return to be made in here, like the, the, in some cases the interest rates that you can charge to the poor, especially if you have a good organizational structure that allows you to keep, um, for example, default rates low, you could actually make a decent return on your money. And so what a nice equation that you can sort of invest in this thing that makes you feel good because you're helping the poor and you end up getting a nice return. So then actual investors, regular investors started pouring money into microfinance. And as they did that, they started bringing in the evaluation metrics and the evaluation models that they use for their traditional investments. And when they did that, then they started putting additional pressure and bringing in all the models of formal finance into microfinance. And so if there was already a structural tension to try and automate and try to sort of standardize things as much as possible, when external investors come in who have the mindset of, of traditional finance, they create e even more pressure to do this. And now they start, they start demanding it from the organizations. Um, and so what you see is, is throughout, especially the 90s, all these microfinance organizations begin to adopt the technologies and the models um, and the organizational structures of, let's say, large-scale banking. That includes like credit score models and things like that. And so sort of the, there's, that's sort of the second layer of the tension that was created. Um, if you notice in all of this, these things that I've described, especially in the second wave of investors coming in and pushing for more efficiency, more profitability out of microfinance, the assumption was there's no trade-off. Like if we automate things, if we standardize, if we become a more efficient organization, the only thing that's happening is that you're turning this organization to a more profitable organization and the rationale was, well, that allows you to reach even more people. Like if you become more efficient, then that means that you can, for the money that you could previously use to reach 100 clients, now you can reach 200 or 300. Therefore, your impact multiplicates. There's no, there's no trade-off there. And that's a bit of a devil's deal. Um, deal.
because it turns out that there is a trade-off there. That the more you automate, the less you can standard, the, the less you can customize, and the less you can focus on the specialized needs of the poorest clients, right? And so there is a trade-off there that was not acknowledged until very recently. Absolutely, and, and one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this work in general is sort of the, the term social enterprise and the social enterprise quote unquote movement has kind of taken off recently. And our students here, for example, love the concept of, of social enterprise. They're very excited by it. I think one of the reasons why they're so excited by it and they're so allured to it is that there's this sense that, oh, I can have my cake and eat it too. I can make money and feel good about it. And one of the things that I want to say to them constantly is like, that's not entirely true. There are trade-offs. In social enterprise, there have to be trade-offs. Because, and to use the, the analogy of microfinance again, when you're providing microfinance services, you're not creating, you're not producing anything. You're giving money to poor people and you're charging an interest rate for it. Every additional dollar of profits you make is a dollar that you're not investing in these poor people or is a dollar that you're taking away from them. And you have to be very aware about this, right? Now, of course, you don't want to waste that dollar. You don't want to have a wasteful organization. But focusing only on profitability and assuming that there's no trade-off, it's, it's just a false assumption. Because that means what, whatever dollar in profits you're not making, you're taking away from somewhere else. And you have to be very aware of that. Right? And that's true for any kind of social enterprise. If you're thinking about sort of environmental social enterprises, any dollar in profits, any additional dollar in profits that you're squeezing out of your model is a dollar that is not going somewhere else. Right? Because it turns out that the reason why we need social enterprise in general is because the market hasn't fixed this. Right? The reason why there's a problem there that requires an NGO and now a social enterprise is because there's something that is non-economic about this problem. Right? If it was economic, the market would have solved it a long time ago. And so we need hybrid models or social enterprise models that can kind of bring the market into this problem in a way that bridges it. But let's be clear that the market hasn't fixed this, and there's no way the market can fix it in and of itself. And so there's a trade-off there. The fact that the problem still exists tells you that there's a trade-off there. And that if you want to go into that problem and, and assume that you can make as much money as firms that are operating um, in, in non-social enterprise models, or regular un, un enterprises, there, there's a weird assumption that you're making there.